I'm going to talk about some of the recent advances uh, in heart failure in the short period of time that I have, and clearly I won't be able to cover this topic that well as I would like to, but uh, uh, you all know that heart failure today is one of the most important and fastest growing disease in the world. Certainly in the West, it is the most important and debilitating disease. Over 10 million patients are predicted by 2037. It is today the costliest disease to treat over or nearly $40 billion a year for its treatment in hospitalizations alone. Uh, although we don't have figures for our own country, for India, but there is no reason to believe that these would be any different here in this country, particularly now that we're doing such a wonderful job in preventing deaths from coronary artery disease. Now, the good news here is that over the last few years, we've done a remarkable job in decreasing the mortality in these patients. And this, look at this, from 2001, between 87 and 2000, there has been a remarkable decrease in the mortality of these patients. Nevertheless, the disease remains a very malignant one, more malignant than most cancer. And here is some data to show how it is comparable to T4 non-cell uh, lung cancer, the mortality rate. Now, whenever you see a patient with heart failure, whether it is in the clinic or in, the, uh, in an uh, outpatient setting or in uh, an ER, when they come in heart failure, they really come in two modalities, the bimodal distribution of their ejection fraction. Notice how half of them are in low ejection fraction, less than about 40, and half are normal ejection fraction. Now here is how you diagnose them. You see the one on the left, a large heart which is not contracting that well. All the chambers are enlarged. And the list heart really doesn't look very different from a normal heart. It really has to be with a great deliberation, looking at Doppler uh, parameters to see whether or not this patient has heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And we'll come to that in a minute. But who are these patients? How are they different from each other? Now, here is some data showing that as compared to people with the reduced ejection fraction, those with preserved ejection fraction here have, I don't know what happened here, uh, are actually older, are more likely to be females, less likely to have coronary artery disease or any of the sequelae, more likely to have hypertension and all the co-variables that uh, co, co, uh, uh, co diseases like atrial fibrillation, COPD, and anemia. And they, as you see, have higher blood pressure. So distinctly, they are very different. But if you have a patient in front of you, you cannot tell whether he has preserved or depressed ejection fraction. When they come in heart failure, they have the same amount of edema, they have the same amount of, uh, of orthopnea, of PND, rest edema, uh, crackles or crepitations in the lung, their JVD is elevated to the same extent. The only difference may be that they do not have a third heart sound and their heart, of course, are much smaller. And the reason is that the salt and water retention which causes the symptoms uh, have the same pathophysiology. In patients with reduced ejection fraction, they have less uh, stroke volume and their cardiac output low. In preserved ejection fraction, because the heart is stiff, they are unable again to produce a cardiac output which is sufficient for the needs of the body that threatens the arterial blood pressure, causes a barometer mediator uh, increase in all the neurohormones, leading to systemic vasoconstriction, vasoconstriction in the renal bed, and salt and water retention. So in the syndrome of heart failure, you have an imbalance, an imbalance between the vasoconstrictor neurohorm shown here and the vasodilator shown on this side. 
And the vasoconstrictors not only worsen the hemodynamic, but cause progressive remodeling of the heart, which is deleterious. On the other hand, the vasodilator neurohormones are beneficial to you. They cause improve the hemodynamic, they are vasodilators, and they prevent remodeling. And so for the many years that we've known this, we have tried to examine the hypothesis that blocking this arm and promoting this arm or stimulating this arm would be helpful. And whereas we have had remarkable success in this part of the study in blocking the neurohumeral uh, vasoconstrictor neurohormones, we've had very little success until very recently in stimulating the vasodilator arms. And here is what we have been able to accumulate over the last uh, 20 years. We've, in the late 80s, when the only drug available was digitalis and diuretics, and there may be some of you who only had that available. And then, since then, with the availability of ACE inhibitors, the angiotensin receptor blockers, and uh, uh, the beta blockers, uh, uh, as well as the devices, the mortality has gone down from about 30%, as you see on the left bars, to less than 10%. A remarkable achievement. And this, unfortunately, hasn't happened in the heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. But after the discoveries that I just showed you, we had a lull of about 10 years when no new drugs came up. But suddenly last year, we have a bonanza of true drugs that appeared and have reduced, uh, increased the chances that we could reduce the mortality of this lethal disease even further. The first of them came from this uh, particular observation. The observation that in patients who are given a beta blocker, the reduction in mortality is related to the degree of heart, uh, reduction in heart rate. Now, the greater the reduction in heart rate, the greater the mortality reduction. Now, you know there are a large number of patients who cannot take a beta blocker or cannot take an adequate dose of a beta blocker. And in those patients, there is need for a drug that will reduce the heart rate. And so uh, efforts by the pharmaceutical industry, and this was Servier in France, uh, isolated a compound, actually was a designer drug that has an effect only on the sinus node and is a pure heart rate reducing agent. When this agent was tested in the SHIFT trial, you see how there was a, a large 18% reduction of the primary endpoint, which is highly uh, significant. Now, as I mentioned to you, we've had great success in blocking this left side of the pathway, the vasoconstrictor arm, but very little in this arm. And all the studies we've done by giving nitric, uh, by giving nitric oxide donors, particularly uh, nitric, uh, natriuretic peptides, have been uh, unsuccessful. One of the reasons, of course, is these endogenous uh, vasopeptides, uh, and here are the names of some of them, actually are destroyed very quickly as they go into the circulation fed by enzymes called nepracil. Although the effect of these are wonderful, they cause a reduction in the neurohormonal activation, they reduce vascular tone, they reduce cardiac fibrosis and sodium retention. But when given from outside, they last no more than a few minutes. And that might be the reason that giving these drugs intravenously over a long period of time has no effect on these patients. So the hypothesis then was, why not go and design a drug that will inhibit a neprosil? And that would therefore cause the accumulation of these peptides and have a beneficial effect. That was exactly what was again done as a designer drug by Novartis some years ago, and they combined uh, the inhibitor of uh, neprosil, uh, sarcubitin, along with an angiotensin A1 receptor blocker, well, sartin into this count, compound called LCZ-696, uh, and now it's called Entresto. The use of this drug was tested in this trial called Paradigm Heart Failure Trial, 
which uh, uh, resulted in a huge reduction of about 20% uh, of cardiovascular death and heart failure hospitalization. The most remarkable finding was that it reduced mortality, all-cause mortality, by uh, 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 16%. This is very important because in Nalapril had been shown previously when tested against uh, a placebo to reduce mortality by 16% as well. And here is a drug, LCZ, that reduced mortality e by another 16%. So if LCZ was to be tested against the placebo, one would expect a mortality reduction of 32 or so percent, unheard of in uh, the realm of uh, a heart failure. Now because of that, the FDA took very unusual step of recognizing and uh, yeah, this drug and approving it within a few months of the announcement of this trial and, and said that it should be used to reduce the risk of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure in patients with chronic heart failure, class 2 to 4, with reduced ejection fraction. But look what the statement was. It should be used in place of ACE inhibitor or ARBs to replace them with, uh, 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 with these drugs. A major uh, statement by uh, the FDA. And for the last year or so, we have it available in the Western countries. Hopefully, it should be available in India in the very near future. Let's come to the second uh, part of my lecture. What about heart failure with preserved ejection fraction? And as I just so showed you, what a remarkable progress in, in heart failure with the uh, uh, reduced ejection fraction. Notice no such luck with preserved ejection fraction because all the trials that we did in this study, all the, test, the drugs that we tested for reduced ejection fraction like ACE inhibitors, ARBs or beta blockers had no effect on mortality in this particular condition. And hence, the guidelines came up with this idea that no drugs have yet to be shown to convincingly reduce the morbidity and mortality in patients with heart failure with the ejection fraction. So the treatment of this today, guidelines drive, is only symptomatic. Reduce fluid retention with diuretics, reduce the blood pressure if that is elevated, treat coronary artery disease, and so on. Now, recently, there is a ray of hope, and this was the trial that we carried out with the uh, FDA that was uh, 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 sponsored by the National Institute of Health, and the objectives were to determine if treatment with spiral electron can produce clinical meaningful reduction in the composite endpoint of patients who have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. It was a very large trial. Uh, six stu countries studied it, 270 centers, spiral lector versus matching placebo. 3,445 patients. Uh, U.S. was the largest recruiter, followed by Russia, Georgia, uh, uh, Canada, and Brazil. It turned out that Russia and Georgia uh, 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 randomize half the patients and the rest of the countries in the Americas, the other half. When we looked at the, uh, uh, the, the primary endpoint, it was reduced by 11%, but unfortunately this was not significant. But the secondary endpoint of hospitalizations for heart failure was reduced by 17%, and this was highly significant. But when we looked at the data very carefully, it became clear that there were major differences in the populations that came from Americas on the one hand and Russia and Georgia on the other. There were differences in the prognosis in the population that they enrolled and the responses to the therapy. Now here is what we have plotted as the uh, event rates by uh, regions, and this is America on the top, and you see the event rate of 12.6 per 100 patient years compared to only 2.3 per 100 patient years from Russia and Georgia. And that rate is so low that it is even lower than you would expect in patients who have normal, like you and me sitting in this audience. 
five four difference between Americas and the Russia. So we wondered whether these patients actually have heart failure at all. So when we go ahead and look at the effect of the drug in these uh, uh, regions uh, uh, alone, we will find an astonishing figure. But let's look at what these figures really mean. Here are patients uh, in the top cat trial, the annual mortality or the mortality per 100 patient years was 2.7. But the mortality in the normal population was 3.1. Actually, the normal population was living long, uh, uh, less uh, long than those, uh, longer than those in, uh, uh, in this uh, study. Now, to compare the same thing in Georgia, in, in Topcat, uh, the mortality is only 1.2, half that of the patients who, uh, uh, of the normal people. So clearly these people did not have heart failure. They were more like normal people. Now look at United States and you find that there is a threefold increase in mortality in, in these patients, suggesting that they were really the patients who had the disease. And when we look at the effect of the drug in these two uh, different communities, you note that there is a highly significant 18% reduction in the Americans, but not in those who come from Georgia and, uh, and Russia. In fact, a 10% excess mortality in those patients. Moreover, when we looked at the effect of the drug on blood pressure, as expected, the blood pressure fell in the Americans, but not so in the, uh, in the Russians. Spironolactone is meant to cause hyperkalemia, and it did in the Americans, but not in the uh, in the uh, patients who came from uh, Georgia and Russia. And likewise, there was no increase in creatinine in these patients from Russia and Georgia, but the expected creatinine increase was seen. So we uh, concluded that uh, there was big questions about the diagnosis of these patients from Russia and Georgia. <clears throat> and number two, we questioned whether the patients even were taking the drug, even if they had the disease at all. And that therefore means that we should only look at the data from uh, the Russians to be able to say whether this drug has an effect on uh, patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, which as I just said, it, uh, contributes 50% of all the patients and we have no drug available for this uh, condition. So I would recommend that we give this drug to these patients. Now, we did a small trial, a proof-of-concept trial, in, in these patients with preserved ejection fraction, only 290 patients, using the same drug that was used in Paradigm, the LCZ696, the RNA compound. And this showed that the surrogate endpoint of, of BNP, or anti-pro-BNP, actually was reduced. So was other surrogate markers, the left atrial size, the left atrial volume. And that led us to design this large trial called Paragon. We have almost completed randomization in this trial. Uh, hope to have the results by the end, uh, uh, hope to fully randomize it by the end of uh, December and have the data uh, available in about two years. India has participating in it, but we had lots of problems in getting uh, the drug controller of India to approve the trial in, tri in time, and hopefully at least few, we'll have a, a hundred or so patients from India to say whether the drug also has an effect uh, in these patients. So to conclude and to summarize then, heart failure remains an extremely morbid and deadly condition. Treatment of patients with heart failure and depressed ejection fraction using evidence-based medicine of, of ARBs and ACE inhibitors, beta blockers, and mandrelocorticoid receptor antagonists have resulted in remarkable improvement in their outcome. Devices have also helped, but it is likely also that the Recent new true drugs that I talked about, Cornelor and Tresto, will improve the mortality even further. 
In patients uh, with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction, the other side of our heart failure population, the treatment remains empirical. Guide rates, as I said, suggest control of blood pressure, uh, careful monitoring of the blood volume. I believe that spironolactone is the most promising agent and should be given, uh, but there is need to test other drugs in this condition. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for sharing your valuable uh, clinical experience. Now the session is open for question and answer. So if you have any question, you can ask to sir. Hello. Yes. Uh, I'm from PGI. Nice to see you after 26 years back in Calcutta. So when I entered in 1990, you left PGI. Anyway, thank you for uh, ha having the opportunity to see you again. I can't, I can't the same hear health. you very well. So I'm from I'm from PGI Chandigarh. So when I entered in 1990, that time you left. Yeah. So I did my MD and DMs. And your, your nice to see you after 26 years in the same physic and your same. Your face is familiar. The <laughs> same medicine. Now I'm using interest of I have used interest of for last uh, two months only in five patients, especially when I'm using interest of with uh, SGL2 inhibitors. The requirement of diabetic is going. Uh, very low, and uh, what do you think? If you give uh, this interest hope with SGL2 inhibitor, how do you monitor them? You definitely reduce diuretic. But surprisingly, if you do BNP, BNP goes up, and NT pro BNP goes down. Yeah. It's so, how do you monitor them? Yeah. Very good question. I didn't realize that Interesto was actually available. In the it's country. not available in India, but you can buy it from Dubai, Bangkok, and Singapore. Oh, I see. Yeah. So one of the, uh, the questions, I mean, I didn't have time to go into the physiology of uh, uh, the biomarkers over here, but uh, he's absolutely correct that when you give the drug, it's meant to increase BNP. That's how it works. It blocks the enzyme that destroys BNP and you want the BNP to go up so that it can have beneficial effects in the body. So if you were to measure BNP in patients who have received this, it will be very high and say, hey, you're doing something wrong to this patient. He's deteriorating. Uh, but that is not the case. But when you look at anti-pro-BNP, that is not a substrate for neprosil. Neprosil does not destroy uh, uh, anti-pro-BNP. So if you inhibit neprosil, the levels of anti-pro-BNP do not go up. And hence, if you were to monitor your patients who are going to be on this drug, you got to be very careful not to measure BNP, but to measure anti-pro-BN. Thank you for bringing that topic up. It's very, very important uh, question. Professor Anand, I have got one question regarding this paradigm heart failure trial. Now, the thing is that the molecule which has been used for this study, that is valsartan sacubitril, and it was compared with the enalapril. But uh, the thing is that why it was not compared with, I mean, valsartan itself, why the sacubitril valsartan combination was not compared with the Valsartan itself. Why not only with the enalapril? What is the reason? Yeah, it's a very good question again. Why? Because the drug contains Valsartan plus uh, the Neprosil inhibitor. The question is, why did you not compare it with Valsartan? That is a very logical question. The problem is that Valsartan has never been compared with placebo. What we wanted to show was the comparison of LCZ with the standard of care. Now, Valsartan is never given alone unless you cannot take uh, an ACE inhibitor. So those drug, uh, uh, the drug has never been tested against placebo. It has been tested on top of an ACE inhibitor. And that was the Valheft trial, which used Diavan. And hence, we wanted to really be able to compare it with the standard of care, which is an allopralitz. You know, in the SOL trial, there was a 16% reduction in mortality uh, compared to placebo. And here I showed you that diagram showing that in addition to the 16% that was seen with an allopralitz, there was another 16% reduction with uh, 
uh, with uh, Interesto. Now, the trial that we are doing at this moment, I mentioned to you in preserved ejection fraction, there we are comparing with Relsartan because there has never been a drug that has shown to be beneficial in patients with preserved ejection fraction. So it is logical that we should do that kind of thing. A very good question again. Two very nice, clearly mean that you... And that is helpful in, in, in patients with preserved. The life study has showed long back is a trial with Losartan and uh, atenolol that showed that Losartan reduced LV mass. Yes, Losartan. Losartan reduced the LV mass and that is beneficial in patients with preserved ejection fraction in heart failure. Why didn't you try that one? Well, uh, the life study was. Uh, a study of hypertensive patients, but Losartan, you are correct, was tested in, in two trials. Actually, now there are three trials uh, where uh, first the test was between Losartan and Captopril. And there, uh, Captopril actually was more superior than Losartan. The reason was that the dose of Losartan used in that trial was only 50 milligrams a day. And that's too small a dose. And comparing with, uh, low, uh, with Captopril, uh, 25 milligrams TID. Now, the second trial looked at uh, uh, the same doses, but it was a bigger trial. The third trial was HEAL, which they looked at 150 milligrams uh, against uh, 50 milligrams. So none of those trials actually were placebo-controlled trials. They were active control trial, either with uh, 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 the higher and lower dose of Velsa uh, or low sartan or uh, with captopril, and hence that comparison couldn't have passed. Best of time. Now, Professor Anand, uh, another question about that manage management of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Up till now, there is no standardized treatment available. What you said about the TopCat trial, the role of spironolactam. But uh, 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 is it the fact that in spironolactone is useful only in those patients who are having significant fibrosis in the left ventricular myocardium, which is being detected by MR? Well, no. No one has actually looked at fibrosis as a marker to select patients. That's what you are trying to yes, say. Yes. Well, it would be very good. We do not know how to select them. And if we had that, the Russian-Georgian affair will not have happened. What did, why did it happen in Russia and Georgia? Because these patients came with edema, they had normal ejection fraction on echo, and they said, ah, this is heart failure with normal ejection fraction. But I say that these people probably had, they were obese, they had edema because of that. They had COPD, they had chest infection, they had some edema because of that. They had rals and crepitations in their basin because they had uh, chest infection and they were all lumped and labeled as heart failure. But there was no good, still isn't a very good single test for diagnosing heart failure with preserved ejection frank. That's why uh, it's uh, so difficult to treat this condition and if there were a test like looking at MR uh, for uh, Fibrosis, well, that would be an excellent way to select these patients. Uh, okay, let's, uh, we have one last question now. Role of gene therapy and especially its scope in our country like India. I, I, said, I didn't get that question. Gene, role of gene therapy. Which therapy? Gene. Genetic. Gen <laughs> oh, gene therapy, genomic yeah. therapy. Yeah. And scope in India. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, we have very little data from stem cells or gene, gene therapy or introducing genes in the, in the body. The best example was the study done uh, uh, recently looking at introducing the Sarka gene into uh, the cell of these patients. And unfortunately, the phase one, phase two trials were very good, 
But when we did the phase three trial, it had to be stopped because there were more uh, deleterious effects than beneficial effects of that particular gene therapy. No gene therapy has so far proven to be good. No large-scale uh, hard endpoint study has shown uh, stem cell therapy to be uh, helpful. But those trials are going on, so maybe in a few years we'll have something. Uh, thank thank you, you so much. Thank you very much, sir.